In this video, we'll be creating the dropdown, which is the final setting type that we'll be adding to our menu, so let's get started. To give us a starting point, let's duplicate the slider setting from the last video and rename it to dropdown setting. Now delete all of the content of the slider setting and change the label to say dropdown. Then create a new UI block to be the root of our content with a left alignment and X position of 50%, as well as expanding the height. And then to maintain a space of 50 from the label, be sure to set a left margin of 50. And then size it up to be as wide as you want your dropdown to be. Then add a child UI block 2D called selection and expand both the width and the height. Set the color to a slightly brighter version of our backing panel color and round the corners. And then add an outer border using our accent color and an inner shadow using a slightly toned down version of our accent color. Let's also set the left and right padding to 25 so that the content of the dropdown doesn't go all the way out to the edges. Now let's duplicate the label for our setting and move it under selection. I'll left align it and zero out the X position, then I'll change the starting text and decrease the font size to 36. Then I'll add an arrow icon on the right side of the dropdown. The arrow texture can be found in the UI controls packaged with Nova, and like the toggles check mark, we'll add a gradient using our accent color just to spice it up. And that wraps up the visuals for when the dropdown is collapsed. Now let's add the visuals for when the dropdown is expanded. Create a new UI block 2D under content called expanded root. Expand its width and then top align it and set its Y position to 100%. That way as it resizes, it will resize downward. Set its color to be the backing panel color, round the corners, and then add an outer border using our accent color. Then add a UI block called items under the expanded root. This will be the root for all the different options that a user can select from. Expand its width. As for the height, we actually want that to change based on the number of options in the dropdown. So let's first design what a dropdown item will look like. To speed things up, I duplicate the selection UI block we created earlier to use as a starting point. I move it under items, rename it to dropdown item, and zero out the Y position. Then I adjust how it looks by setting the color to the backing panel color, zeroing out the corner radius, disabling the border and inner shadow, and finally disabling auto size on the Y axis and setting the height to 80. Then I adjust the label by changing its default text and reducing the font size to 32 and rename arrow to selected indicator as well as change its texture to the check mark and bump it over to the left a little bit. This is what we'll enable and disable based on whether or not the option is the selected option. And now that that's finished, we can enable shrink on the Y axis for the items UI block as well as expanded root. And if we enable auto layout on the Y axis for the items UI block, we can then duplicate our dropdown item and we'll see that everything gets positioned nicely for us. So this is what the dropdown will look like when it's expanded. And while we're not completely done with it, and we'll make some adjustments later, we at least have enough done to test the basic functionality. So like with our other controls, let's open up the settings data types file and add the underlying data type for our dropdown. We'll call it multi option setting and have it inherit from our base setting class. It will have an array of strings, which are the options that the user can select, as well as an int for the currently selected index. We'll also add a helper property called current selection, which if the selected index is valid, will return the corresponding option, otherwise it will return a fallback string. Now let's switch back to Unity and create the file that will contain the item visuals implementation for the dropdown. And here we'll actually be adding two classes that inherit from item visuals, one for the dropdown itself, but another one for the dropdown items, so those are the options in the expanded list. Be sure to mark both of them as serializable, and then starting with the dropdown item visuals, add a reference to the label text block, as well as a UI block 2D for both the background and the selected indicator. Moving on to the visuals for the dropdown itself, it also has a label, as well as a label showing the currently selected option. And then we'll also want to add a reference to the background UI block 2D so that we can change its color based on interaction state, the expanded root UI block so that we can enable and disable it, and the options list view so that we can populate it with the list of options. And finally, we'll add three colors for our interaction states as well as a primary row color and a secondary row color so we can alternate the rows of the options in the expanded list. And with that done, let's add our item visuals types to what we built out in Unity. Let's start with the dropdown item. First, add the item view component and select drop down item visuals as the type. Then drag in the label, background, and selected indicator. Be sure to also add the interactable component since we want these to respond to input. And let's also add one to the selection UI block while we're at it. Now let's do the drop down itself. Change the type over to drop down visuals and then drag in the label, selected label, background, and expanded root. As for the options list, we haven't actually added a list view yet, so let's add one to the items UI block. 
And in order to use the list view, we need to provide it with the one or more prefabs that will be used to represent the items in the underlying data source. So I'll create a new folder called prefabs and then turn our dropdown item into a prefab, as well as delete the three items that we were using for testing. And now we can provide that prefab to the list view, as well as serialize the list view on the dropdown visuals. And finally, we can do the colors. Like we've done before, I'll use the body color as the default color, the inner shadow color as the pressed color, and then I'll split the difference for the hovered color. As for the rows, I'll use the backing panel color as the primary row color, and then just brighten it up a bit for the secondary row color. Now that we've finished setting that up, let's open up our settings menu script to begin the implementation for the dropdown. And here we'll continue following the pattern that we use for the toggle and slider by adding a multi-option setting as our temporary data source, as well as a reference to the dropdown's item view. And then we'll add a bind method, which will take in a multi-option setting as the data source, as well as the dropdown visuals. We'll set the label's text to be the setting's name, and the selected label's text to be the current selection. We also want to make sure that the dropdown is collapsed initially, so let's add a collapse method to the dropdown visuals class, which will simply disable the expanded root game object, and then we'll make sure to call that in the bind method. Then we can bind our dropdown in the start method, like we do with our other controls, as well as start adding our gesture handlers. I'll start with the same four visual-only gestures that we handle for the toggle, so that's hover, unhover, press, and release. And like the toggle, we want to change the background color based on the interaction state. However, since the dropdown also has the expanded list underneath it, and we don't want the dropdown itself to react to these presses and hovers when they occur to items in that expanded list, we'll add a check so that if the receiver is a child of the expanded root, we'll simply do nothing. And we'll use the same logic for all four gesture handlers, changing out the color for the corresponding interaction state. Now let's switch back to our settings menu and add a click gesture handler. We'll want to do something different depending on whether or not the dropdown is expanded, so let's add an isExpanded property to our toggle visuals, which simply returns the active state of expanded root. Then, in the click handler, if the dropdown is expanded, we'll collapse it. Otherwise, we want to expand it, so we also need to add an expand method to our dropdown visuals. We'll have the expand method take in the data source setting, and since we'll potentially want to modify the setting if the user ends up selecting a different option, we'll add a member to track it and set that at the beginning of our expand method. We also want to register some event handlers for the dropdown items, but since any given instance of our dropdown visuals may be pooled and reused for multiple different settings, and we only want to register our event handlers once, I'll add a member to track whether or not we've already registered them and return early if we have. Now we can begin registering our gesture handlers. First, I'll add the same four visual-only gestures that we added for the dropdown. However, this time, instead of adding our gesture handlers on a UI block, we'll be calling add gesture handler on the list view. This is essentially the same thing, with the added bonus that it will provide us with the index of the gestured item in the data source. For the implementation of these, we'll simply set the item's background color, just like we did with the dropdown itself. The only difference will be the unhovered gesture, in which case we need to set the item's background color to be either the primary row color or secondary row color, depending on if the item's index is even or odd. Next, let's add a click gesture handler for when the user selects an option from the expanded list. And here we'll update the underlying settings selected index to be the new index, update the dropdown's selected label to be the new current selection, consume the event so that it doesn't propagate up as a click on the dropdown itself, and finally collapse the dropdown. And now we can add the final event handler that we'll need, which is the data binder. We'll talk more about data binding in the next video when we move the menu itself over to use data binding, but since this is the first time we're encountering it in this series, I'll give a brief overview here. The add data binder method is a method with two generic arguments. The first generic argument is a data type in the data source, and the second generic argument is the type of the item visuals that we want to use to represent the data type of the first argument. In other words, by calling this method with these arguments, we're telling the list view, whenever you see an item in the data source of type string, hand us a list item prefab with a dropdown item visuals on it. When the list view eventually invokes this callback, it will provide us with both the string from the data source that we want to display, along with the dropdown item visuals object we'll use to display it. This will give us the opportunity to bind the string to the dropdown item visuals prefab that we assigned in the editor earlier. And the way we'll do this binding is by updating the label's text to display the option, which we can get from the user data field of the on bind struct, setting the selected indicator's active state based on whether the index is equal to the setting's selected index, and changing the item's background color based on whether the index is even or odd. And now, with all of our event handlers registered and implemented, let's finish implementing expand.
First, be sure to call Ensure Event Handlers, then enable the expanded root game object, and finally, set the data source on the options list view by calling set data source and passing in the options from the underlying setting. And with that, we finish implementing the expand method, so let's be sure to call it in the click handler of our settings menu, and now we can switch over to Unity and test it out. First, we need to fill out our data source setting. I'll have it be called quality and add a low, medium, and high option. Then, drag in the dropdown's item view, and now if we play, we see that the label and the selected label has changed, and if we click on the dropdown, we get the list of options, which, if we select one, the selected label updates appropriately. And with that, we have the base functionality of our dropdown working. But we're not done yet, there are a few issues we need to resolve. First, if we move the dropdown up in the hierarchy, the expanded menu will render underneath the toggle in the slider since it now comes earlier in the hierarchy. We can easily fix this by simply adding a sort group to the expanded root and setting the sort order to 1. So let's do that. Another issue is caused by the fact that a dropdown can have a potentially large number of options. To illustrate the situation, I'll add several more options to our data source setting, and now we can see that the expanded list expands down very far, even beyond the bounds of the menu. To fix this, we'll clamp the height and make the options list scrollable. First, I'll set a max height on the items UI block of 240, which is equivalent to three items. Then I'll add a clip mask component to clip all of the options that fall outside of those bounds. As you can see, it's now properly sized and clipped. Finally, to make the list scrollable, we need to add the scroller component. And now we can scroll the list, although it's scrolling a bit slower than I'd like, so I'll adjust the scroll multiplier to 10, and now we have a properly scrolling dropdown. So let's stop playing and reapply those changes. And since the options list is now scrollable, it might be useful to give the user a visual indicator showing that they can scroll the list. So while we're at it, let's also add a scroll bar. First, I'll add a few dropdown items just so we have a visual to work against. Then, let's add a UI block under expanded root to be our scroll bar track. I'll right align it and expand its height. Then I'll bump it out to the left, size up its width a little bit, and set a top and bottom margin of 5 just to give it some breathing room from the edges. Underneath that, I'll add a UI block 2D to be the actual scroll bar and expand its width. The height doesn't matter because it will be adjusted by the scroller later, but just for design purposes, I'll set it to 50%. Then I'll set the color to white and add a horizontal gradient using our accent color, as well as round the corners and also add an inner shadow using our accent color. And now, if we provide the scroll bar to the scroller component, it will automatically adjust the size and position of it as the list is scrolled. Let's test this out, but be sure to delete those three items that we added for design purposes. It looks like the scroll bar is working as expected. However, whenever the dropdown opens, it always opens at the start of the list, which means if we selected an option further down in the list, it won't be in view when the list opens. This isn't necessarily a bug, but it would be nicer if the list opened up to the currently selected option, so let's make that change. To get that behavior, Open up the dropdown visuals class, and after calling set data source in the expand method, add a call to jump to index using the currently selected index. And now, whenever the dropdown opens, it always opens to the currently selected option. And with that, we finish the final control that we'll be using. In the final video, we'll bring it all together and add tabs and data binding to our settings menu.